Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Dagan, non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this event, featuring Esther George, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. We are just delighted to be hosting President George for this event. She is going to offer remarks on the US economic outlook, and then I will moderate a Q&A session. Um, let me say first a few words about President George. She has a long history with the Federal Reserve System, having joined the Kansas City Fed as a bank examiner in 1982. She has um, years of experience thinking about bank supervision, regulation, and she is a leading expert on those topics. She has also served in a variety of leadership roles at the Kansas City Fed and in the broader Federal Reserve System. Um, of course, the role that she is best known for is for being president of the Kansas City Fed, a position that she has occupied since 2011. So I think it's fair to say that she has served on um, the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, during times when the committee was confronting a huge range of important monetary policy challenges. And um, among the many other important things that President George is known uh, for is hosting the annual Jackson Hole Economic Symposium in Wyoming, an event that has um, been profoundly important to making good monetary policy, not just in the United States, but globally, as it brings together international central bankers, researchers, and uh, policymakers to discuss issues affecting the global economy. So um, with that introduction, I am going to turn things over to President George to talk about the economy. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for the introduction and my thanks to the Peterson Institute for uh, the invitation to be part of this program. It's a pleasure to, to join you today. Let me start um, where you left off. Uh, two weeks ago, the Kansas City Fed hosted its annual Jackson Hole Economic uh, Policy Symposium. The theme of this year's program focused on uh, a title, Reassessing Constraints on the Economy and Policy. And as your audience would know, an elaboration of constraints has been a valuable contribution of the field of economics. Things like opportunity costs, comparative advantage, the Phillips curve are all defined around the existence of constraints and limits. But over the past quarter century, the economic conversation has been dominated by concerns over insufficient demand and supply constraints really faded into the background. Supporting that shift, recent recessions up until the pandemic have largely been attributed to financial disruptions related to demand being supported by unsustainable asset allocations. This is different from the supply shocks and inflationary dynamics that had driven earlier post-war recessions. The economic recovery that's followed this pandemic shock has brought supply considerations back to center stage. Bottlenecks and shortages related to pandemic disruptions have limited supply and driven up prices, and more generally, strong demand supported by a historic level of fiscal and monetary accommodation has pushed on the capacity limits of the economy. With demand no longer insufficient, supply constraints have become a key factor in the outlook for economic activity. And the policy response to the pandemic has raised additional questions about constraints. The extraordinary fiscal and monetary response to the pandemic appeared to redraw the boundaries of policy. Innovative and expansive fiscal programs pushed debt to GDP ratios to new highs as central bank balance sheets expanded rapidly with little discussion of constraints at the time. Against this backdrop, I'm gonna take a few minutes uh, and talk about the current outlook for the economy and for policy. On the economy, I'll argue that the constraints revealed by the pandemic are likely to be with us for some time, perpetuating imbalances, contributing to inflation, and likely requiring a sustained policy response. I'll also argue that constraints continue to bind policy with a focus on the balance sheet and efforts to significantly reduce it from its current elevated level. 
So starting with the outlook, high inflation is certainly a sign that constraints are binding the economy. Prices is measured by the personal consumption expenditures, PECA, which the Fed uses, increased over 6% in the 12 months ending in July, which is down from June's 40-year high, but still well above the FOMC's 2% objective. Energy prices have played an outsized role in inflation over the past year. Oil prices rose with the war in Ukraine, fell back a bit over the summer as recession fears grew. Food prices also have contributed to this rise in inflation. In part, this is related to the run-up in ag commodity prices connected to the war in Ukraine, but it's also a result of stressed growing conditions in many regions around the world, including the western portion of the Kansas City Feds region that I serve. But it's not just food and energy prices driving inflation, as you know. When you exclude food and energy and look at the core PCE prices, those have risen 4.6% over the past 12 months, also near a 40-year high. And this rise in inflation has been very broad-based with almost every category of consumption recording an increase in prices and about a third of those categories showing increases far above trend. The widespread nature of inflation suggests that a tight economy is driving those price pressures rather than solely individual supply disruptions and shocks. And there are two main factors that I think uh, look to be contributing to this tightness. The first is as the economy reopened throughout 2021, we saw demand surge, underpinned by a tremendous amount of fiscal and monetary policy support. Federal government provided roughly $6 trillion of fiscal stimulus since the start of the pandemic. And of course, monetary policy was also very accommodative as the Fed cut interest rates to zero and added more than $4 trillion to its balance sheet. So while consumption growth has moderated this year, the level of demand continues to be strong, particularly for goods. For example, the consumption of durable goods continues to run about 20% above its pre-pandemic trend. The other factor that's boosting inflation has been the inability of the supply side of the economy to keep up with this strength of demand. At first, that lack of supply seemed to largely reflect temporary disruptions related to the closing and then reopening of the economy. Now, it seems increasingly apparent that there's been more persistent damage to the supply side of the economy as a result of the pandemic. There are three factors that I think coming out of the pandemic looked likely to present a continued drag on economic supply that relates to damage to global supply chains, the quick destruction of capacity in the service sector, and the long lasting damage to workforce engagement and labor force participation. And I'll touch quickly on each of those. The shock of the pandemic shutdowns, the sudden shift to goods consumption continues to reverberate throughout the global economy with shortages and logistical snarls still plaguing many industries. Of course, the war in Ukraine, the disruptions to European energy supply, and drought conditions across the globe that have disrupted both ag and inland transportation as rivers run dry have only contributed further to those supply disruptions. There's been some discussion that recent shocks could elicit permanent changes in production processes as the efficiency of just-in-time production and global networks gives way to the accumulation of unproductive inventories and a preference for resiliency over efficiency, the damage to global productivity could prove to be more permanent. A second supply factor contributing to the tightness of the economy, particularly in the services sector, has been the quick destruction of capacity in a number of industries. Today, we see services inflation has picked up to 4.6%, the fastest pace in decades even as services consumption remains some 4% below its pre-pandemic trend. Elevated inflation would suggest the sector is at capacity, although relative to its pre-pandemic levels, there would still appear to be considerable slack. One concrete example of a relatively persistent reduction in capacity 
appears to be playing out in the airline industry today. Airfares have climbed 15% above pre-pandemic levels. A strong demand has run up on a system that has yet to fully recover. Labor markets are then a third factor shaping the outlook for the supply side of the economy. While employment growth has been robust, the unemployment rate has fallen to near record lows, workforce engagement continues to lag. The labor force participation rate remains one percentage point below pre-pandemic levels, of course, representing some 2 million missing workers. The decline in participation is now concentrated among those older than 55 and likely reflects early retirements and health concerns, decisions which can be sticky and difficult to reverse. In contrast, the pandemic-induced decline in the participation among prime-age women, which likely reflected disruptions to dependent care, has now completely reversed with participation by prime-age women near an all-time high in July. One additional factor holding back the ability of supply to ease inflation pressures also has been the abysmal recent performance of productivity. Labor productivity as measured by output per hour declined almost 6% at an annual rate in the first half of the year. It was the largest two quarter decline on record. This sharp fall off in measured productivity is not surprising when we consider that the economy added some 3 million new workers in the first half of the year, even as the level of output as defined by GDP declined a percentage point at an annual rate. When we look back over history, GDP has almost never declined for two quarters, even as the recorded number of hours worked has increased. So let me turn to monetary policy considerations as we think about that outlook for the economy. If I uh, could, I want to repeat a phrase that has become all too common throughout this pandemic, which is, we are in unprecedented times. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy cannot, of course, reverse supply shocks or loosen the constraints that have boosted inflation. It can, however, moderate the pace of demand growth to narrow these imbalances in the economy and reduce price pressures. By raising interest rates, the Fed can help manage demand growth in part by incentivizing saving over consumption and also through the effect on asset prices and financial market conditions. By taking deliberate policy actions, the Fed can also prevent high inflation from becoming embedded in price and wage setting behavior. For many workers, recent wage increases have not kept pace with price inflation and those declining real or inflation adjusted wages are not sustainable and could lead workers and businesses to build high inflation into future wage contracts to the long-term detriment of the labor market. Instead, experience has shown that low and stable inflation is most conducive to promoting sustainable growth and to maintaining a strong labor market that benefits households, workers, and businesses. Of course, since March, the FOMC has increased the policy rate by some 225 basis points and beginning this month has accelerated the process of shrinking the Fed's large balance sheet. In response to these actions and with the expectations of further rate hikes, broader financial conditions have tightened, particularly when you look at mortgage uh, rates and other borrowing rates. But the policy rate is still relatively low the balance sheet is still near $9 trillion and imbalances in the economy, which are pushing up inflation, the case for continuing to remove policy accommodation remains clear cut in my view. The questions are by how much and how quickly. On the question of how much, of course, uh, further tightening is gonna be required. I think only careful observation of the economy is gonna give us the answer to that. As unsatisfying as it might be, weighing in on the peak policy rate is likely just speculation at this point. The often discussed neutral rate of interest or the tipping point between accommodative and restrictive policy is an unobserved and potentially unstable benchmark, potentially undermining its value as either a guide for policy or for public communication. 
Whether any level of the interest rate is accommodative or restrictive will depend on the interest sensitivity of the economy, which could vary for any number of reasons. For example, as spending shifted away from services toward relatively interest sensitive housing and durable goods during the pandemic, the economy may have become more susceptible to higher interest rates. However, the significant accumulation of liquid savings during the pandemic could work in the opposite direction, dampening the effects of higher interest rates on spending and of course, ultimately inflation. So we'll have to determine the course of our policy through observation, I think, rather than reference to theoretical models or pre-pandemic trends. Given the likely lags in the pass-through of tighter monetary policy to real economic conditions, this argues, in my view, for steadiness and purposefulness over speed. The path of policy is also likely to influence plans to shrink the Federal Reserve's elevated balance sheet. The economy, of course, is in unfamiliar territory with a combination of high inflation and tight labor markets not seen in decades. So markets are understandably volatile as they grapple with the many unknowns surrounding the outlook for the economy. Limiting the extent to which uncertainty about the pace of interest rate adjustments contributes to this volatility could be important as the balance sheet runoff hits its stride. Certainly relative to the last time balance sheet reduction was initiated in 2017, market conditions are considerably more unsettled. And to the extent that strains in the treasury market can be attributed in part to heightened uncertainty about the path of policy rates, a steady path of rate increases and predictability adjusting this path to incoming data could improve market functioning and facilitate our balance sheet runoff. Successfully shrinking the balance sheet will lessen the Federal Reserve's footprint in financial markets. And in particular, the large balance sheet is distorting the price of duration and artificially flattening the yield curve in a way that could promote a reach for yield by investors with potential implications for financial stability. Despite plans announced last May to significantly reduce the size of the balance sheet, the potential exists that there is an asymmetry that allows for relatively easy increases in the balance sheet, but makes subsequent decreases more difficult. In a paper presented at this year's Jackson Hole Symposium, authors argued that financial markets can become dependent on the increased liquidity added to the system as the balance sheet expands. After markets have adapted and allocated the massive increase in liquidity from asset purchases, subsequently reducing the balance sheet can be difficult. As a result, large reductions in liquidity, especially absent a signal on longer run objectives for the balance sheet, could result in volatility like we witnessed in September of 2019. One implication is that a clear signal to financial markets that an expanded balance sheet is temporary and not meant to be permanent could dampen volatility and ease the drawdown in liquidity in the longer run. This is an important argument, I think, as the Federal Reserve considers the ultimate size of its balance sheet. Having committed to operating in an ample reserves regime, what constitutes ample can evolve over time and will be dependent on the decisions of financial market participants. A persistently large balance sheet could lead banks to adjust their business models around a high level of central bank liquidity, which then raises the amount of reserves required to maintain that ample regime. Avoiding this threat will require clear signaling of resolve to shrink the balance sheet and remove liquidity. And I think given a clear signal, markets are less likely to become liquidity dependent and adjust their behavior in anticipation of declining reserve balances. There may be benefits to announcing the desired reserve levels as the balance sheet shrinks, giving banks time to prepare to operate with significantly fewer reserves. So thank you, Karen, uh, for having me, and I look forward to our discussion to follow. Thank you, 
very much for those remarks. Uh, uh, it was all very interesting. I, I'd like to uh, kind of explore in more depth uh, some of these issues. Um, I thought one interesting uh, point you made uh, was that uh, in these unusual times in particular, uh, you're, you're doing more um, kind of gauging the effects of monetary policy through observation of what's going on in the economy. And I was just wondering on that note, whether you could talk about what are some of the key indicators you're looking at as you're trying to assess whether um, monetary policy is achieving its the, the goals that you're headed towards uh, and, and uh, you know, just how far along you are in terms of that path. Yeah, it's a great question because um, certainly I don't mean to suggest we throw out um, looking at uh, the data that serves us well, that we throw out the models that help us understand um, how under different scenarios the economy might unfold. But the observation part of that I think is particularly important seeing that the economy is adjusting right now to these imbalances and to really an unusual kind of shock as we come uh, through this recovery period. And so one of the pieces uh, of data that I find particularly useful right now are talking to our regional contacts. And we do this always, but I think it takes on a particular significance at a time of uncertainty, at a time of trying to make sense of the data and understanding whether the lags that I think are still there in terms of how our policy transmits are playing out in the real economy. So you will find me really doubling down on talking to business leaders, talking to people in the community that are looking ahead six months or 12 months. And I can look back at the data and say, are you confirming a trend I'm seeing? Does it look like you are contradicting that in some way? that would give me a sense of how the economy is unfolding. And I just think that's gonna be particularly important through the rest of this year and going into next year to know when we're approaching turning points and shifts that will be important for how we make decisions about interest rates. Thank you, that, that's, um, that is uh, a really interesting perspective. I, I think uh, economists are, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate over, you know, data versus uh, more qualitative evidence. And it, it seems like uh, in recognition of uh, the limitations of our data, it is important to do that. Um, you didn't use the words uh, soft landing <laughs> in your remarks, um, but I was hoping you could talk a little more about um, prospects for a soft landing. Uh, you know, do you think it's, it's possible? to reduce inflation uh, without a recession? Uh, and um, how worried are you that it, it won't work out that way? Yeah, that's a question that's dominated a lot of conversations, as you know, Karen, including the ones at Jackson Hole. Um, I would just say soft landing would be first prize uh, for sure. And I think when you look at how the economy is evolving, we continue to see consumption uh, holding up. It is. It is coming down for sure, uh, but we continue to see demand. Uh, CEOs that I talked to recently continue to be optimistic that consumers have the wherewithal. Their balance sheets are in better position. Uh, certainly since the last time the Fed went through a tightening cycle, uh, the savings, excess savings uh, seem to be supportive um, at this point. And so I think when you look at that, combined with how many people do have jobs today and are getting some wage increases, there is support there to say, we have uh, some room to run in terms of bringing those interest rates up and trying to cool some of that demand off. So clearly, if we all could choose, which of these scenarios would we want? It would be that one. I think to be very realistic though, when you look at how tight the labor market is, and again, that's probably the number one thing I hear from our contacts is this is a difficult economy in which to bring workers in uh, and to be able to meet the demand that I see today. And so we're having uh, a low unemployment rate, which is terrific. But when you have high inflation, it means we have more work to do 
And it could mean some sorting out in terms of that trade-off that we think about between bringing inflation down and what that means for the labor market. Thank you. Um, so I'm glad you, you talked about the, the labor market. Uh, you know, one of the um, uh, areas in which the academic community certainly is having a lively debate is about whether labor market pressures can be reduced by monetary policy engineering a um, large fall in, in vacancies and job postings, but only a small increase in the unemployment rate. Since um, historically, it looks like those two series have been pretty um, pretty correlated. Uh, you don't get moves in one without another. Um, so, um, but, I, but I think that the Fed's view is that, um, you know, you know, a soft landing, you know, could be achieved if you could reduce vacancies without increasing unemployment. This is for the wonky people out there known as the beverage curve debate. Um, and I know Fed researchers are working on this question. I was just wondering, wondering if you could talk about your thinking on this issue. Uh, do, do you think that that is possible? You know, um, I never say never because I've been surprised many times about how data unfolds, how the markets move around. I think just as we've talked about it um, here in Kansas City with my team and some of the work they've done, um, it looks to me like when vacancies begin to come down, uh, you, sh you shortly thereafter begin to see the unemployment rate rising. I think those two things will work together. Now, of course, how much and how far, I think, again, is going to be a function of um, how will this demand come down and where will we see inflation uh, begin to move to know how far you have to go. I think, though, um, I've heard the chairman say this. I've, I've heard my colleagues say it, too. There is a strong resolve, though, to say job one right now is to make sure that we bring that inflation rate back to target and that we do that in the interest of sustainable growth and making sure over the long run that we can have a healthy labor market. So that's where the focus is now. And I think, again, um, what's involved in getting there, um, hopefully a soft landing, but there could be um, a more difficult path, uh, certainly too, into getting inflation under control. Thank you. And um, you talked uh, in, in your speech about Jackson Hole, and I was struck by that too, that really kind of this less inflationary uh, or inflation friendly environment uh, or friendly inflation environment that uh, maybe we've entered uh, was, a, was a really key topic of conversation. Um, there are a variety of factors that um, have been cited as contributing to it. You mentioned some in your speech, but these would include less globalization, climate change, geopolitical developments, um, and of course, the risk of expectations ratcheting up. Inflation remains high. And I know uh, you mentioned it. I know uh, the Kansas City Fed has shown leadership on this uh, issue generally, generally thinking about it. Um, but, but on that note, uh, economists are worried that um, as inflation falls, it may become increasingly costly in terms of uh, unemployment for monetary policy to close the gap between inflation and its target. So, you know, for example, getting inflation down to three or three and a half percent may require only a mild increase in unemployment, but going that last mile to 2% could require a much larger increase in unemployment. And um, I was just curious about, uh, you know, your thoughts on uh, whether this is, this is in fact a risk and, um, you know, how, you know, in that position, monetary policy would, would think about that trade-off between kind of getting back to the target uh, and, uh, you know, the costs in terms of increased unemployment? No, it's a great question. And, you know, from where we sit today, um, it feels... Uh, premature to speculate on what the last mile might look like, uh, as you described, as you get closer to the 2% the target. But I think there is no question, we know this historically, that going through a tightening cycle, you do reach a point at where you are deciding, am I reaching uh, the point at which 
we're approaching the landing, that we need to uh, slow down here. We are observing other factors in the economy. And I think, Karen, that will be really one of the key signals is as we begin to approach uh, seeing inflation come down, seeing it come down convincingly, what else is going on in the economy? And that's, you know, that is really always a function of the context in which you're making those decisions. If it looks like inflation is sticky, depending on where, you know, employment is going, will be very informative to us. And again, I'm going to go back to my observation technique to say, I think that will also be one of those times where you are really leaning in to people that are working in the real economy, people that are making decisions to see, am I on a path that will land us there or is it gonna take more work to do that? Always keeping in mind these near-term costs versus long-term. And I think that's always the hard thing is to keep in mind the longer run. What is it we're trying to achieve? And if you go back to the uh, mandate that Congress has given us, you see several times in the Federal Reserve Act, the reference to longer run. So you're right, when we get closer to the destination, it will require us to begin to think more carefully, just as it would a pilot trying to land a plane, beginning to look carefully at the gears, what the flaps are up and the wheels are down. Um, and um, we will have to be mindful of the very things you're talking about. Thank you. Um, and then just on a, on a somewhat different topic, you talked a lot about kind of what you're seeing in the, the U.S. economy, which of, of course is um, the, the focus of U.S. monetary policy. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the, the, the risks out there globally. So particularly as central banks around the world, not just the Federal Reserve, but they tighten policy and that raises interest rates globally. Uh, you know, that's, that's setting up um, challenges for some countries, in addition to all these geopolitical uh, uh, issues that have been challenging some other economies. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about how you see those, those risks and um, the possible feedback for uh, the U.S. economy. Yeah, that's always an important um, aspect, I think, of developing your outlook for the domestic economy is because we do live in a global world and um, we're not immune to, even, even though we may feel it less than some countries, uh, looking at the global outlook is very much a part of understanding how the U.S. economy is going to unfold. So today, for example, um, we're looking at a country like China and, and seeing significant slowdowns and looking to see what does that mean for other parts of the world, what does it mean uh, as it will feed back to us? We're looking at Europe and the challenges they face around an energy crisis and what that means to their economy. And even as you see some uh, simultaneous raising of interest rates where we, those of us that are dealing with high inflation um, are moving in a synchronous uh, direction, those impacts are gonna be uh, different. And so um, watching a global uh, growth outlook that is slowing, I think is important to look at even as we are raising interest rates. So those two parts of the world, I think for me in particular focus, as uh, we watch what happens through the rest of this year, we watch their own monetary policy uh, approaches and what that means. And of course, still, we see, as it goes back to the supply issues we've talked about, those have not completely worked themselves out. And so uh, I think all of those dynamics make this a time to really be thoughtful and think about what we see happening across the globe as we try to set our own uh, outlook for the economy. Yeah, that's great. I, I suppose you didn't mention it explicitly, but when we're talking about slowing growth abroad, one, uh, you know, what effect of that has been, uh, it has in fact strengthened the U.S. dollar. Uh, and um, I, I imagine you're keeping an eye on that as, uh, you know, something that is potentially, um, uh, even, even if it's occurring because of unwelcome developments, potentially um, helping with those inflation pressures. Yeah, I mean, I think it is one of the consequences of the fact that uh, the U.S. economy, again, in a bit of a different place than those other two, 
in a rising rate environment uh, that we have here, I think to be expected that you might see uh, the dollar strengthening relative uh, to some of these others. So, you know, again, in the long term and thinking about the objectives we have to achieve, um, it, it won't be the main issue, but certainly a factor um, in how we see that outlook unfold. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you also talked in your speech about the importance of predictability. And um, I wonder uh, if you could if you could talk about that in the context, um, in particular, of um, the dissent uh, that you had in June against the FOMC's first 75 basis point hike. I think it's fair to say that the dissent um, got some news, uh, but you, you made the case that um, a significant and abrupt change in the interest rate policy could be unsettling to households and small businesses as they make the necessary adjustments. Adjustments, um, and then uh, so, so you know you said that as as a reason to do it, but and you you went on to support a seventy five basis point move um, in July. So um, it, it's it's right to think that this is all you know an, an argument about the importance of predictability. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I think that is in part um, the argument. I think um, I have I have really been focused on the path as opposed to you know what happens around any individual meeting here because I think that's really what's important to keep um, the focus on. But if you think back to June um, and uh, my my concern at the time was really the level of uncertainty that we saw in the economy a lot of volatility in the markets. We were relatively early in the process of beginning to tighten, uh, deploying the balance sheet strategy uh, at that point. And that felt abrupt to me to move 75. It was never a question about, do we need to raise rates? That, that was clear. We were out of sync with where the economy was, where inflation was. So it wasn't an argument about uh, not raising rates. But really thinking about the, the uh, steady and deliberate path that I felt like would be important at a time that we were going through heightened uncertainty. By the time you get to July, I think uh, there had been more internalizing that, less uh, uncertainty about what the Fed was trying to do. And I was comfortable supporting that decision then. But I think as we go uh, forward with this, this idea of really, and this is always true for the, for the central bank, the clarity of communication, the ability to lay out really a strategy around where we're headed um, is important. And we're doing all of that, of course, not only with one of the most aggressive tightening cycles that we've seen, an extraordinarily large balance sheet that again, uh, we'll be moving at double the pace of where we did the last time uh, we were trying to reduce a balance sheet. I'm just mindful that with a lot of moving parts, I think the better able we are to, to have that clarity to be uh, predictable in some sense um, is going to be important, even as we watch the data and understand that when things change, we may have to make those adjustments too. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the balance sheet as, as well. So um, uh, uh, you just brought it up as, as being part of why you were kind of nervous in June about uh, a movement that might be surprising to, to markets. Um, I know uh, that you have um, thought a lot about uh, the balance sheet tightening issues. Um, I um, I was curious about your thoughts on uh, whether we've, we've learned anything to date about this cycle's uh, quantitative tightening. Is it, is, it going, is it going well or not? Um, presumably you're watching it carefully, uh, you know, as, as you and your staff, uh, you know, are, are looking at, at metrics to see if, if, if everything is going smoothly and as expected, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, you know, how are you assessing this and what are you looking at? Yeah, so I think to the point of how's it going, I think you'd have to say, I think it's going well. Uh, we're early in this, uh, and so that's encouraging. Uh, what have we learned about quantitative tightening and, you know, the rundown of the balance sheet? Obviously, we've got one other experience to rely on. 
uh, going back to uh, 2017 as we were beginning to do that. And so certainly uh, we have learned uh, about this tool now a second time. And you will see how the communication around the plan for significantly reducing the balance sheet reflects that. Uh, talking about applying caps as we do the runoff so that there's some, again, predictability there around that runoff. So I think you certainly see in this iteration of a balance sheet rundown some of those, um, some of those learns, the, the lessons learned uh, over this period. The things that I watch though carefully, again, is looking at what it means to have such a sizable footprint in the markets. Um, you know, early on looking at the size of the additions to our balance sheet, um, we estimated was applying downward pressure to longer term rates. And so again, when I think about the long run, I think for me having the central bank a smaller footprint in the markets, even as we support this ample reserves regime, uh, should be doable. And I think it should be an objective. Um, as I said in the speech, I think at some point it might be helpful to really provide a little more definition around where we think the, that level will be. So right now we're focused on starting it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I think we just have to be always mindful. This is a large uh, balance sheet for sure. And as we watch how the financial markets evolve, how the take up as those assets mature, uh, evolve, I think it's, it's important for us to uh, keep an eye on the balance sheet. I don't think of it as running in the background. I think it will be inextricably linked to our success in raising interest rates. Um, and having that accompany uh, in a complementary way, the removal of that accommodation. Sure. And I, and I gather from what you are saying, uh, we shouldn't assume that pre-pandemic norms about the appropriate size of the balance sheet uh, apply here. No, I think it's, it's true. So I'm delighted to see so far, so good. Uh, but I think again, so many things we're looking at today um, we're looking for historical references. We're looking for models to help us understand, but I think no substitute for just being a bit uh, careful and observant as this goes forward and uh, making sure that it's uh, not interfering with the, the key objective we have, and that is getting inflation down right now. Yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting the way you just put it, kind of not interfering with the key objective. And, and you said before, you need to be thinking about this all the time uh, in conjunction with what you're doing with the policy rate. Um, so, so, you know, you've emphasized, uh, you know, with your balance sheet policy, uh, the goal, you know, one goal, smaller footprint. And you can think of kind of another thing to use the balance sheet for is actually conducting monetary policy, just like you, know, you raised interest rates to tighten monetary policy. So as you think about those two goals, is it mostly, you know, as you, as you think about what you're trying to achieve, is it mostly about trying to get the balance sheet, you know, down to uh, a smaller size, size to shrink your footprint, or, or do you see it as a powerful tool for also curbing inflation, like as, as you do interest rates? Yeah. So I would say at the outset, I think this tool is something that is going to require a lot more research. So again, I, you know, we've used it twice now. As I listen to researchers uh, look into this and estimate what its impact is, I, I think it's clear to me a lot better understanding could be useful to policymakers in the future about how this particular policy instrument works. We know that it boosts asset values. Uh, and I and it's why I think you hear central banks, including the FOMC, talking about short-term interest rates as the primary tool, as its main tool, better understood uh, historically, uh, certainly than these balance sheet policies. So the reality is we will likely have to think about both of these in tandem getting that balance sheet back down. I think, you know, another reason is just to say, if you're going to have to use this particular tool again, you'd like to be able to give yourself some room to do that, to begin to uh, roll that balance sheet back as much as you can uh, after, you, after you boost it 
uh, really gives you that kind of option uh, given a future downturn or a time when you may want to bring it back out. Um, and, and just as a final note on, on balance sheets, um, and the balance sheet has you know, both Treasury Securities and MBS. <coughs> Uh, a lot of the discussion has been around the, uh, you know, that reducing, you know, the, the, the treasury runoff part of it. Uh, any, any thoughts about uh, MBS? Well, if you look at the plan as outlined, um, it really did emphasize getting back to um, a primarily treasury uh, a balance sheet. And I very much support that. Uh, the accumulation of mortgage-backed securities is a form of credit allocation. And I think uh, beginning to shift that balance sheet's composition is going to be important. Again, this is not something that is likely to happen in the near term. And it could be that it will involve the sale of assets, depending on how things evolve, if you're going to really get back to the uh, plan that we have laid out, which is to get to a treasuries only. So I uh, would and did support that plan to shift that balance sheet and the composition of it. And I am hopeful, not today, where rates are, uh, that portfolio is probably gonna sit there for a little bit, but uh, it may require sales at some point to begin to make that compositional adjustment. Thank you. Um, so, so let me, get, um, you know, with our remaining time to turn away from monetary policy, uh, it would be great to talk about some of the other important functions of the Federal Reserve System. One is uh, payments. Uh, and in particular, uh, I want to ask about the Fed, the Fed Now system, uh, which allows individuals and businesses to send instant payments through their depository institution accounts. Um, can you talk about the, the Fed's role uh, in the payment system and um, what the Fed is trying to accomplish with FedNow and its other efforts? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. I've been spending uh, a good chunk of the last uh, few years thinking about the evolution of the payment system and many of the changes we see and what role the Federal Reserve will play in that. Um, which is a longstanding role, as you know, Karen, for the Federal Reserve Banks uh, from their founding have been involved in a very key way in making sure that the payment system is accessible, that it's secure, um, and that it's efficient uh, across the country. And really, I see its direct contribution to one of financial and economic stability for the country. So, the role in providing these payment services to uh, the banking industry has been an important role. And as that payment system has evolved from paper checks that had to be moved around uh, the country to electronic means of payment, whether it's direct deposit, we began to see uh, really a rapid evolution as people had more mobile ways to buy and sell things of also wanting to pay for things uh, in a similar way. And you began to see the desire for speed in terms of doing that. If you're a small business, speed means a lot when you get a sale and are able to convert that back uh, into inventory again. Uh, individuals can benefit from the receipt uh, of money in a way that began to see adoption growing. And so several years ago, the Federal Reserve made the decision to build out a new rail, a real-time settlement rail for retail payments in this country. And that would run alongside um, a rail that uh, was laid out ahead of us by some of the largest banks in doing that. And again, that has been an approach that has been quite successful in my view for the country in being able to deliver from the largest banks to the smallest, the capabilities to provide Americans with the kinds of payment uh, vehicles that allow them to conduct commerce, to be paid and, and many other things. So we're getting close. Uh, we announced recently that uh, next summer, we would roll out uh, the first iteration of this new payment rail for the banking system that would allow them to provide that real time 24 by seven by 365 payments uh, capability. I think of it as laying new highways 
uh, on which uh, the economy can build, on which businesses, the marketplace can continue to add to and uh, build out this capability for the country. So, I, so I'm excited about seeing that uh, come to fruition uh, and beginning to see that evolution of the payment system benefit from its wide access, applying some securities uh, as it relates to fraud and other things. And of course, thinking about that's a very efficient way to begin to move money. Um, and, and you um, you talked about kind of the value of, of more speed and how it how it makes the economy more efficient. I was wondering, do you, do you also see this a financial inclusion issue? I've, I've heard people argue that uh, people who are underbanked, so they have a bank account, but they turn to alternative financial services, sometimes they do that uh, for reasons of, of speed. So can you talk about your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that aspect was among the many things we looked at when we thought about use cases and as we have observed how people are using it. The issue of the underbanked, unbanked has been a really a difficult one to solve for. You, you've heard policymakers and, and researchers talking about this for several decades. But I do think as you begin to modernize uh, these rails, that opportunity can grow from that. And I expect there will be some innovation that will make it more attractive, easier, uh, whatever the barriers are for individuals to be able to take advantage of something like this. So I certainly would keep that out there as a potential use case for FedNow and real-time payments more generally. Thank, thank you. And um, I, you, you know, I know the whole issue around central bank digital currencies, it's, it's a huge issue. And I know there's tons of banking going on in the Federal Reserve System at other central banks. and generally amongst experts around the world. So I don't want to take you too far, too far down that rabbit hole, but I just, in the context of, of, of FedNow, some people have, have argued that FedNow um, is a, could be a substitute for one, some of what central bank digital currency uh, you know, would aim to accomplish. I was wondering if you agree with, with that perspective. Yeah, this is such an interesting time, I think, uh, whether we're talking about cryptocurrencies, central banks thinking about uh, central bank digital currency, and just a lot of speculation right now with, with much less definition about uh, what it is that uh, we need to accomplish and where that ultimately will go. So I think it's going to be a fascinating area to watch as both central banks think about this, as the marketplace thinks about where it's going. Um, clearly, because these real-time payments and the settlement of that is really in front of us. So this is now um, something that is a reality for the country and many other parts of the world also with these capabilities. I think the innovation that will come off that hopefully can inform then what we think about uh, the future of these alternative Forms, whether they'll be used as payments, whether it will center them more in another uh, aspect of the economy. And I think for central bank digital currency, you really have to think again, is that more of a wholesale kind of product uh, versus a retail product, which today in the United States seems to be uh, a pretty deep customer needs met by uh, the existing players in the market. So I think that's going to be a fascinating part of the evolution of our financial system, of how central banks think about their role. Um, I won't have the same front row seat, uh, maybe that uh, you will at that point, but uh, for right now, I'm really excited about the capabilities that real-time payments, um, including our FedNow product, is going to be able to provide. Thank you, and I really look forward to watching this issue evolve as well. Um, you know, uh, before uh, we go, um, you know, I, I, I need to ask you just a, a little bit about bank supervision and, and regulations that has been such an important part of your career and you've known, you've thought so much about it. Uh, so that's another function of the Fed system. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, just, you know, on, on what some of the key issues are uh, that should be on the top of regulators' minds these days. Yeah. Yeah, so my, uh, my introduction to the Federal Reserve was through uh, supervision and regulation. Uh, when I started was really 
um, a terrible time economically uh, in 1982 and through most of the 80s, where in my part of the country, uh, hundreds of banks failed at that time. It was an important learning for me about how communities, about how individuals suffer when they do not have access to credit, they don't have access to uh, their money, the, the livelihoods that they depended on. And as we've watched the banking system uh, evolve over time, we've watched more concentration in the industry where now you have very small banks uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, very large banks thinking about what allows for the stability of that system. I think what has not changed through all that evolution is the, is the importance of those vehicles, that access to credit, uh, the role. And in, in my part of the country, Karen, we have thousands of community banks. And I will tell you, those banks play an enormously important role, not just in the provision of their services, to their customers, but you will find these entities are key leaders in their communities, whether they're serving on the school board, the hospital board, they really are the lifeblood of many of these communities. And so I think as policymakers, as regulators, look at issues around regulatory burden, capital requirements, many of those things, I think it will be important to keep in mind, not preserving one kind of entity over the other, but really thinking about the public they serve, the communities they serve, and how vital they are to so many communities around our country. That has really been, I think, a lesson that uh, has prevailed throughout my time at the Kansas City Fed. Thank you. Um, I have um, uh, one final question I'd like to end with. Um, so, so you, are, uh, you have all this experience in the Fed system and in very important roles. You are one of the longest serving Federal Reserve Bank presidents. Um, as I said earlier, uh, you know, during your time uh, as president, you've been part of the committee navigating a lot of, of challenging monetary policy issues. And um, I was wondering if you could share some, some wisdom with us about what what you've learned about what it takes to be successful in an FOMC meeting. You know, so, so what would you say to kind of a new member of the committee about um, how to be effective and how to move the committee in the direction that they'd like to see the, the committee go? go? Well, I, I've watched many of the new members on the committee today and uh, they bring uh, tremendous contributions to these uh, difficult discussions we have. My own experience has really, um, really informed how I think about my role today as a voting member, which is when you go to those meetings, you must do your homework. I mean, I don't think there are any shortcuts here. You don't, you don't wing it ahead of time. You, you really invest in understanding both the data that you have, the advice you get from your team, and these observations of going out in the community to understand. So doing your homework, I think, for the job that you have in an FOMC meeting is critical. I think the second thing is, this is a large committee. Um, we make decisions by consensus here, but I think the diversity of views that come to that table is so important. And so I've always felt like it's my obligation to bring uh, a view to that table, an informed view, one that is thoughtful in its contribution to the discussion. But when it is time to make a decision, you have to really vote your convictions around that. And I think that accrues trust to the public and understanding the decision-making process. It is not to undermine in any way. And the last thing I would say, Karen, is you have to bring a huge dose of humility to that assignment because None of us have uh, the whole picture. It's never about, in my view, being right or being wrong. It's about the contribution that you really come to make to a committee that's trying to arrive at the best way to achieve our objectives. So I'll see if I can package that up and hand it to my successor. <laughs> Please do. Uh, well, I want to wrap up by um, by thanking you so much for taking uh, you know time out of the many uh, important things that, that you're doing. 
uh, to deliver some prepared remarks, but especially to thank you for uh, hanging around to take uh, questions. Uh, we've covered a, a ton of ground in the last hour, and I think you've answered uh, a lot of the questions on, on people's minds uh, that are out there. Uh, so, so thank you so much uh, for that. It really has been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Karen. It's been nice to visit with you, and I appreciate the chance to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, you know, before we close out, um, I, I, I want to tell the audience uh, that you're invited to tune in for a couple of other uh, Peterson events that we have uh, coming um, up. Uh, so, so next week we are hosting uh, Jared Bernstein, a uh, member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors on Tuesday, September 14th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then on October 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we are um, hosting President uh, Georgia's new colleague, Federal Reserve Board Governor Lisa Cook for her first speech since she joined uh, the Board of Governors in May. So um, thank you everyone uh, for joining the uh, event today and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.